Yeah, let, let's get a little ice hockey talk going. We got Sam Carcitti from the Inquirer on. Sam, I, I'm ready to you, for you to tell me, when can I see some Flyers hockey? My guess is uh, January 13th, but uh, uh, that's what the league is floating out there anyway. But uh, they still have some obstacles, and uh, I expect some kind of decision to be made next week, uh, probably in the middle of the week. There's a lot of things to iron out, and including COVID protocols, whether the games will be played uh, in home arenas or whether they'll have a bubble for each of the four divisions. Uh, the economics, the labor issues have been resolved. The, uh, as you probably know, the, the owners tried to uh, get the players to, uh, to tweak the CBA a little bit on things that were agreed upon in July, and the players had none of that. So, uh, you know, we just have basic issues that uh, on where to play the games, when to play the games, when training camp will start. And uh, it, it looks like training camps will probably start January 3rd. If that happens, the season would start January 13th with no exhibition games. But as I said, everything is fluid. Everything is moving, um, even the divisions. You know, they, they thought they had the division set up. And uh, the last couple of days, it looks like some teams are going to be switching divisions. So it does look like, though, the Flyers and Penguins will be in the same division, which is a, a good thing the way it should be. It shouldn't even be a question. But uh as I said, the NHL still has some things to iron out. Uh, best case is January 13th. With the divisions, are we going to see that all-Canadian division happen? Yeah, no question. Uh, because of travel restrictions caused by the pandemic, uh, you know, we will see all seven Canadian teams together. And, uh, and, and it's going to get tricky because, you know, the way it looks, it appears four teams in each division will make the playoffs. So four of seven, I mean, obviously, um, you know, more than 50% are going to make it in that division. But what happens, you know, once we get past the second round? In other words, uh, one plays four, two plays three, and then the winners meet. And then after that, the Canadian teams are obviously going to have to cross over and play in the U.S. and vice versa. So, you know, that's another thing that the uh, – <laughs> the NHL has to figure out. Now they're hopeful, I guess, because of a vaccine and, and uh, maybe fans being allowed in the, in arenas, they're hopeful that that will not be an issue, but you never know. That could be an issue still, you know, if borders are still closed when the playoffs start, um, you know, in May, um, we're going to have a major issue and and maybe they'll play games in in bubble cities again for the, for the Canadian teams in, in a playoff. But, uh, that is to be determined, but uh, the NHL has a lot on its plate right now, and uh, you know, hopefully, the vaccine will uh, alleviate a lot of these questions. And I, I think what they'll do, I think what they'll say is that uh, the playoffs uh, will be announced, uh, the format, and uh, where the games will be played. That will probably be decided at a later time. You know, Sam, that, that's all stuff to be decided down the road. My big concern right now is, are these guys get, able to get in shape? Uh, you know, we're used to seeing them at the skate zone, you know, this close to a season starting, all playing together. Obviously, they're scattered throughout the globe. A lot of them probably don't have access to ice rinks and things like that. What have you been hearing about how the Flyers have been keeping in touch with the players and whether the players are keeping themselves in shape to the, the best ability that they can? Yeah, good question. But most of the players, and in fact, all the players I've talked to, actually have been skating. And, uh, you know, I talked to James Van Riemsdyk the other day. He's in Minnesota. He just built a new house there. and He's got a, a state-of-the-art gym in his house, and he's been able to skate four or five times a week, uh, you know, close to his house. And, uh, you know, most of these guys I've talked to have been skating uh, at least three or four times a week. And uh, they've all been working out five days a week. Ivan Provro has been in Voorhees for over two months now. And uh, he's been skating probably four times a week. He's been lifting weights five times a week. Um, you know, he, he's a machine, <laughs> Provro. He will be um, close to, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say they will be 100%. But I think program will be close to 100%. I think most of these guys will be, you know, 85%, 80% when they get in the camp. And I think by the time the season starts, you know, they'll probably be more like 90 to 95%. Um, 
and then uh, they'll gradually get into uh, be in 100% shape once the season starts. And they're going to be in, in pretty good shape because I think the schedule is going to be a lot more condensed. Right now, the plan is to play 56 games. That's if the season starts on January 13th. If the season starts, say, February 1st, then you're looking at maybe a 48-game season. Uh, still condensed season. You're going to have a lot of a lot of games, three games and four nights and back-to-back games. For that reason, um, the, the number one goalie probably is is not going to be able to play, you know, 80% of the games or 85% of the games. And and with the Flyers, of course, Carter Hart, you know, maybe he'll play 70, 75% of the games. But they're going to need uh, a lot of contributions from Brian Elliott. Elliott's a, a solid pro. I don't think that'll be a problem. But on some teams, you know, where, where there's clearly a, a number one and the number two is – uh, maybe a, a rookie or somebody that's not tested and, and maybe not even the same same stratosphere as the number one guy, that could be a problem. So it's going to be interesting. You, you're going to have to have two solid goalies. There's no question. And uh, the NHL is also trying to decide how many players are on a roster. As you know, right now you're at 23. They're kicking around having 26, and I would think you would carry an extra goalie there too. So Alex Lyon would probably – travel with the Flyers, and uh, they're mm-hmm. also going to have a taxi squad, and that could add even four more players that travel with the team. So uh, this should all be announced next week. And, uh, you know, like I said, hopefully we have a 56-game season. But, uh, uh, you know, we're getting, we're getting close to a deadline. I think they almost have to announce it next week because players have to come in and they have to quarantine. Some have to quarantine for a week, some maybe a little bit longer. So – Every time we have you on, we ask the question, how's Nolan Patrick doing? Yeah, the, Nolan Patrick has been very uh, quiet and evasive. And, and uh, uh, I'm told from people in the organization he's been scrimmaging in Manitoba. Uh, he lives in Winnipeg, and, and he's been scrimmaging, and he's done well. And uh, also told by somebody, uh, one of his teammates, that uh, – I talked to him, um, you know, within the last month that uh, the headaches are subsiding and he's sleeping a lot better. So these are all good signs. Uh, I actually tried to talk to Nolan about about his progress, but uh, uh, he doesn't want to talk about it now. So the bottom line is we will not know until he comes into camp and and uh, and and really has contact. I think contact is the number one thing with him. As you know, he had the migraine disorder last year and the headaches were. Uh, really debilitating, and uh, you know he's going to have to have contact, and he's and he's going to have to. Uh, we're going to have to see how he is the next day, the day after that. But all signs are positive. Uh, Chuck Fletcher went on record and saying he is going to play this year. Uh, whether he's ready for the start of the season, that remains to be seen. But he he makes this team. If he's 100, percent he makes this team so much better because it, it drops Scott Lawton probably down to the fourth line center. And uh, I think Patrick, if healthy again, uh, is ready to have a breakout year. He had two, two seasons of 13 goals. I think last year was going to be a breakout year for him simply because he, you know, he's a year more mature, a year stronger. And most importantly, he's now going to have better matchups as a third line center, as opposed to when he was here the first two years and, and, the previous year, his last year he played, he was a second-line center. The matchups were not as good. But, of course, they picked up Kevin Hayes, and that slides Patrick down to number three. And and uh, just getting better matchups is going to do a world of good for him. So, you know, hopefully he can go early in the season. And as I said, he gives this team so much more depth and, and makes them a lot better, no question about it. And we've got about – Five minutes, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you. Uh, Philly's great Dick Allen passed away this week. I, I saw your Facebook post about him. You've been a longtime proponent of him belonging in the Hall of Fame. For people in the city, if they somehow didn't know how good Dick Allen was, everything he overcame, what he meant to the sport, can you give us a couple minutes synopsis of what, what made him so special? Yeah, I'll tell you what. As, as a young, impressionable kid in the 1960s, uh, Richie Allen, that's what we called him back then. He, he didn't want to be called Dick till later on in his career, but uh, Rich, Richie, Dick Allen, whatever you call him, he was an awesome power hitter. The likes, you know, I have never seen in Philadelphia. I'm talking about 
the distance in his home runs. I, I can't tell you how many times I saw him hit a ball over the roof in left field, which, you know, not many players could even reach, you know, the roof on top of it was a double deck bleachers out there. And, uh, you know, he would hit home runs that disappeared over, over the light towers and over the build the Alpo signs and the, uh, Cadillac signs on, on top of the roof to go over that and is the North Philly night. I saw him hit home runs. Connie Mack Stadium uh, at one point was 447 feet to dead center field, which you never see nowadays, but uh, that's a mammoth jolt. And beyond that, they had uh, the batting cages that they used for pregame uh, batting practice. They would wheel them in and then at the end of batting practice, they wheel them back out, open the door where the 447 sign was, and then put the batting cage in there. Beyond that was a flagpole. And I, you know, I saw Richie Allen hit home runs over the 447 sign, <laughs> over uh, the backstop back there, over, you know, past the flagpole. So, you know, you're talking about 500, 530 home, foot home runs. And they were just majestic shots. And, and the great thing about him was that he could hit balls just as far to right field. It was a right-handed hitter. He had the strongest wrist I've ever seen. He used a 42-ounce bat and wasn't overly big, especially by today's standards. It was maybe 5'11 and, uh, you know, maybe 195 pounds. But his wrist uh, and his forearms, they were like tree trunks. And he just, you know, he waved that bat around. And a 42-ounce bat is probably about 8 ounces heavier than, than most uh, the, most of the bats the players use, and he would just swing the bat like it was a twig. I mean, like it was a toothpick, and uh, just the quickest uh, swing, quickest release. He had problems when he came up uh, fielding because Gene Walk was the manager back then, and Allen had played shortstop. He had played the outfield, and they put him at third base, a new position, and uh, he really struggled, but he worked hard to get better as a fielder. Later on, he moved to first base, played a lot of left field. Uh, but as you mentioned, uh, the obstacles that he had to overcome, um, you know, I, I was fortunate. I got to uh, interview Dick. He came back to the Phillies. Um, he ended up being traded from the Phillies to the Cardinals and kicked around with the Dodgers and had great years with the White Sox and won an MVP with the White Sox. And, and he came back to the Phillies in 1975. I was fortunate I got to interview him then, and, and I was a young reporter. And he, um, at that time, he, he kind of steered the conversation back to Little Rock, Arkansas. That was the Phillies farm team back then, their top farm team. And it was not a good place for uh, a black player at to- that time. And he endured so much racism. And he still wanted to talk about it in the 1970s. It, it was still painful to him. And... Uh, you know, just the insults that are received down there. And it, it just, it just was not a good fit. And uh, sadly that it, 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 it was America in the 1960s and he endured a lot. He endured uh, the racial taunts. Uh, he endured uh, a new position. And uh, when he came up here, he became rookie of the year in 1964. And he was the catalyst, him and Johnny Callis and Jim Bunning, Chris Short, they were the catalyst to a Phillies team that came out of nowhere and should have won the pennant. They were six and a half games up with 12 to go, and the rest is history. They blew the pennant and, uh, uh, you know, never got close again during Allen's tenure with the Phillies. But, um, you know, for, for that, his first decade, you look at all the numbers now, uh, you know, his, his on base, his uh, slugging percentage, uh, he was the premier player in baseball for a 10-year period. His numbers – were better than Willie Mays, you know, um, better than Hank Aaron, better than Frank Robinson. I mean, these guys are all Hall of Famers. So, to me, there's there's no question he should be in the Hall of Fame. And, and it's just sad that, uh, uh, you know, he passed away and, and that he isn't in there. there. There was a lot of shady things done with the Veterans Committee. And uh, it's just sad that he didn't get in. But thankfully, the Phillies, you have to salute them. They retired his number. Uh, last year, and and uh, his 15 will never be worn again by a Phillies player, and and uh, it meant so much to him, and, and it was such a gratifying day for him and his family, and and I'm just so so happy he he at least got to experience that. 
and we definitely hope <clears throat> he makes it into the Hall of Fame. Uh, Sam, thanks always for your time. We look forward to more hockey stuff, more Dick Allen stuff, and always talking to you. Uh, you have a great one. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. Happy holidays to you. Same to you.